The country I live in is set to significantly decriminalize marijuana this year. In preparation for a public with more widespread, or at the very least, more transparent use of cannabis, let's learn as much as we can about it. From a pharmacological perspective, that is. Unlike other drugs discussed on this channel, when we're talking about marijuana, we're not just talking about one active component. We're talking about piles and piles and piles. For brevity, let's cover the main three. Tetrahydrocannabinol, cannabidiol, and cannabinol. Mechanism of action. THC bonds to the G protein coupled receptors known as CB1 and CB2. Activating these receptors inhibits adenyl cyclase, resulting in a decreased production of CAMP and changes in ion channel activity. Through these receptors, cannabinoids hyperpolarize neurons by closing voltage dependent calcium channels and activating potassium channels. It also allosterically modulates opiate receptors. These stimulated CB1 receptors are found in brain cells relating to memory, movement, concentration, thought, and perception, but not found in the brainstem, which is why marijuana doesn't cause respiratory depression like opiates do. CBD, in contrast with THC, doesn't cause psychoactive effects and seems to actually downregulate anxiety and disordered thinking, having no impact on CB1 and CB2 receptors, instead blocking THC at these receptors. CBD inhibits fatty acid amide hydrolase, an enzyme that breaks down anandamide, a member of your body's naturally operating cannabinoid messenger system, thus further inhibiting cannabinoid receptor stimulation. CBD also affects signaling receptors like 5-HT3A and 5-HT1A, which can shift the scales in several anxiety disorders and epilepsy. CBD, like THC, is also a positive allosteric modulator of opiate receptors. And finally, CBN, another non-psychoactive and found only in trace amounts. It binds preferentially to CB2 receptors, found mostly on various immune cells like dendritic cells, macrophages, B cells, and T cells. CBN triggers apoptosis in these cells, which inhibits their effects, because they're dead. Now, what are people doing with receptors designed exactly for cannabis in their bodies? They exist for our body's internal cannabinoid messenger chemicals. The two main ones are anandamide and... 2-AG. When not being ridden like a mechanical bull by the active ingredients of marijuana, CB1 and CB2 are activated by our endocannabinoids to perform roles such as regulation of energy intake, energy storage, and restoring homeostasis following stress. Indications. Holy macaroni fish, probably easier to list the things it's not being marketed for. Mentioning only the indications I was able to find in the readings I have available, and by no means exhaustive. Nausea and hunger stimulation. Why? The components of marijuana stimulate cannabinoid receptors in the brain relating to nausea and hunger. Pain and inflammation. Why? Marijuana allosterically modulates opiate receptors, decreases inflammation through apoptosis of immune cells, and shuts off prostaglandin synthesis, which keeps nociceptor thresholds high. Also, CB1 receptors are expressed in the neural cells of brain areas responsible for the receiving of nociceptor signals. Tapering these stimulus receiver sites decreases pain sensation. Wasting syndrome. Why? Less nausea and more hunger? Decreased wasting syndrome, which is the unwanted weight loss associated with disease processes like cancer and AIDS. Glaucoma. Why? Because marijuana reduces intraocular pressure. How? We're not sure. I spent weeks trying to track down a good answer for this, but unfortunately at this stage more research is needed. At this point, it just does. As an antispasmodic in MS or spinal injury. Why? Marijuana poking CB1 receptors and decreasing motor activity. For routes, marijuana can be inhaled as either a smoke or a vapor, taken orally, sublingual form, transdermally, rectally, or ophthalmologically. The dose. According to Health Canada, the average user goes through the equivalent of 1 to 3 grams a day. There are many users that consume much less than this, and there are also users who consume well over 5 grams a day. Keep in mind, the potency of a gram can depend on the source. Onset and duration. Inhalation. Onset in 5 minutes, peaking in 15 to 30 minutes, and lasting 2 to 3 hours. For oral. Onset 30 to 90 minutes, with no clear peak, and lasting up to 12 hours. Rectal duration varies greatly depending on the composition of the cannabinoid in question. Best I could find readings on is a peak in 2 to 8 hours. Transdermal peaks in 1 hour and lasts up to 48 hours. And ophthalmological? I couldn't find any solid duration information for. Not enough people willing to put marijuana in their eye, it seems. Contraindications. Known intolerance to marijuana such as allergies or other hypersensitivities that would cause greater harm than good. THC can cross the placenta. Marijuana should not be given to the pregnant patient. It may cause defects. <laughs> I'm going to hell for that one. Use in adolescence is associated with the development of schizophrenia. To be clear, the use of cannabis in adolescence does not cause schizophrenia, but increases the risk of its onset, suggesting interplay between marijuana use and a genetic predisposition for schizophrenia. Precautions. THC can induce tachycardia. 
might not be a good situation for a patient with a fragile ticker. That's it. We're done. There was a long amount of time spent researching this video. Thanks very much for your patience waiting for it. Quality reference material on this subject matter is thin, 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 and finding it is a marathon of digging. The references I did use, though, are in the description below. I'm going to spend a bit of time updating the website, fix a lot of those broken links. I'm sure you're tired of seeing her. And then I'm going to get to work on the next video. Thank you to Nick D for the next medication recommendation.